nation of Israel up there and he expected everybody to go through and of everybody that did not go through um, it wasn't God's fault he didn't bring them up and say okay now let's see you can come and you can come and you're not fast enough and you don't like the right kind of food and you don't he didn't go sorting his heart and his goal and it was important to him that everybody had entered the promised land and I thought what a what a powerful analogy it is to this misconception that you see everywhere is well why would God send a person to hell here's a beautiful example of where it was not his intention to leave them to die in the wilderness he wanted them to all go into the promised land <laughs> And uh, so I'm going to pick up in, in at verse five. Um, this to, I think we probably covered a little bit of this, but uh, it won't hurt <laughs> anything to rerun through it again. But in verse five, it says again in this passage, he said, "They shall not enter my rest, since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because." Not because they weren't good enough, but because of their disobedience. In verse 7 it says, He appoints a certain day today, saying through David so long afterward, in the words already quoted, Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. <clears throat> so what do you do when you hear God's voice? We tend to focus a lot of times when I hear this, I've always thought about, you know, the hardening our heart towards salvation or becoming a Christian. But hardening our hearts, we don't have to just be a non-Christian to harden our hearts. Um, we can harden our hearts as a Christian. Um, I have been very, I have caught myself saying this. Um, somebody needs to... <laughs> Somebody should, somebody needs to stop, somebody needs to, you know, and sometimes I wonder if that's that ninja self-protection thing that the Lord didn't lay it on somebody's heart, <laughs> and the Lord brought it onto my mind. Maybe the Lord's speaking uh, to me. Um, so how do we recognize when God is speaking to us? Um, I would be really tickled uh, if he would just send me a text. Of course, if I received a text from him, would it do any good? I'd be like, okay, who's pranking me? You know, I don't know that that would actually do any good. Or if I got a letter from him, the first thing that I'd do is like, okay, who's pranking me? Um, but how important is it for us to develop the ability to recognize when God is telling us to do something, leading, laying stuff on our heart? I struggled with that. Um, uh, one of the most focus points where I really struggled to hear God speak to me was when I was in the military. I had signed up for six years. Uh, <clears throat> the main reason I didn't want to spend 20 years, of course now that I'm looking back and if I had, that sure really wouldn't have been a bad thing. But uh, at my two year point before you know I would have got to my enlistment uh, termination, um, it really started becoming an issue on my mind. I wonder if I should re-enlist or what should I do with the rest of my I was in, involved in short term missions and I kind of had a few things going on and, and uh, one of the things that was on my heart is I saw how hard it was to have a family uh, being in, in especially the Navy. Uh, it was really difficult and I thought well you know I probably need to figure this out see which way the Lord wants me to go on this so probably for about two years I prayed and I prayed and asked the Lord to lead me and I prayed and I prayed and I read verses and there's no verses in the in the Bible about Navy and whether you should stay in the Navy or get out I couldn't find one anywhere even in opinions because I didn't even have an opinion at that point <clears throat> so I prayed and I prayed and I was bound to determine I'm going to follow the Lord in this and I prayed and I prayed and pretty soon a year <laughs> then I'm down to six months then around three months that's a quarter of a year that's like okay is he busy or is he procrastinating or okay so what's going on here down to a month everybody's asking me if I'm going to stay in and I had a good reputation on ship I I was good at what I did and, and uh, I hadn't really made anybody too mad at me <laughs> at that point and I can remember the uh, the executive officer he come up and asked me about it and he was encouraging me to re-enlist you know and so I'm like well 
So then uh, I actually, got, the captain actually caught me one time and he asked me. And um, the ops boss came by and asked me. And my division officer came by and asked me, all trying to encourage me to sign it. And I told every one of them, I'm waiting for the Lord to lead me. <laughs> <laughs> every one of them, I'm waiting for the Lord's direction. And I waited, and I waited, and I waited down to the day that I had to sign the paper. And I'm like, I've been asking you this for two years, Lord. <clears throat> Why won't you answer me on this? And I'm like, okay, since I can't hear you talking, since I'm not married yet, and Mary's not here to tell me what you're to say, <laughs> she does help me with that a lot. So uh, I'm like, okay, so I've been asking you for two years to which way to go. And I, can't, I am as clueless today as I was the first time I said pray the first time. And I don't know why. So let's do this a little different way. I'm going to pick one. And if you don't tell me which, if that's right or wrong, then you're stuck with it. <laughs> and so I actually signed it. I said, well, here's why I'm going to pick this. I decided to get out. And one of the things is because I wanted to have a family and I just saw how hard it would be to do in the military. So, so, so I want to do this one, Lord, unless you tell me otherwise, I'm going to go in this direction. He never said anything. So I'm assuming <laughs> that I went the direction that he wanted me. I couldn't prove it, you know, by any direction. But I know God's faithful. And maybe in some cases he said, you know what, for where I have you planned, um, I can train you. I can use this to train you. I can use that. It doesn't even matter. Just whichever one of these you pick. I said, I've, what I've got for you is a little later on or who knows how the, but I never did get what I would say he wants me to go this direction I've heard people talk about that and uh, and uh, uh, I always wonder are they really sure of that or are they kind of adding that in there or you know what is that reality I have had God lead me very clearly before and so I think he told me at that point said you can pick whichever one it is just whatever you do be good and honor me and do that's really what I've got for you so just be salt and light and I'll point you when I need you <laughs> you know and so I took that direction but uh, you know there's times where God lets us choose there's times whenever he points his finger and says okay I want you to go do this. When we hear his voice, our reaction is, as they showed here, very significant. <clears throat> One of the things, and I've heard this, and I can't take credit for this, uh, when I was in the, na the Navigators, I remember hearing, and I forgot it until I was working on this, <clears throat> a guy talking about hearing God's, hearing the voice of God. And one of the unglamorous things that he uh, told us was, are you doing the things you're supposed to be doing already? And I'm like, well, that's nothing mystical or exciting or adventurous. <laughs> are you busy doing the stuff you already know? If you want to hear God speak to you, start doing the stuff you already know and I'm like well okay that's kind of <laughs> but that is true if we're busy doing the the regular things that we know and we're faithful in those God will continue to talk to us more for if Joshua had given them rest <clears throat> God would not have spoken of another day later on so then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his work as God did from his. <clears throat> Ephesians 2.10 came to my mind at that point. We're not at our resting point. We're working. We're like the apostles when the disciples left. He said it's finished. He didn't say it's finished for us. <laughs> it's finished for him. He had done his, his part. Ephesians 2.10 says, uh, For I have created you to do good works, which I have prepared in advance for you to do. Um, when we become a Christian, He's already got a to-do list for us. There's already things he's got lined up for, for each of us to do. I, I've watched Dad working on his list for years. Jim, I've seen the, hear the stories that he talks about going in where a lot of people would fear to tread and, and uh, taking the light of Christ into places. And, and uh, Wes, I know he's done that. And Lonnie, I see you and Connie uh, rocking it and doing stuff all over the place. And, and, uh, but we're not done. Our rest is that rest that he's talking about here isn't done. We can rest in Christ because we know our future is certain. We can rest that we know that when we die, we're going to be with him. There's peace that we have, but our punch list's not done. And so, <clears throat> but we strive 
toward that mark of entering that rest. And as we do our list, we encourage and challenge those around us to do the same thing. <clears throat> Verse 11 says, uh, Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. I got to thinking, as we witness to people, do we relate or paint the picture of what is God's rest worth? We're talking about getting saved, but sometimes do we help them understand being saved from what? God's rest. That's a big deal. Paul talked about running the race to win the prize. I mean, he's put everything, his whole focus was centered into this one thing of serving God and going to heaven when he, when he died. <clears throat> John 1, actually, let's skip here. It actually makes a jump here, which I was kind of surprised because it goes from this entering his rest and, and not following the disobedience of the, uh, of the Jews in the desert. And then it immediately makes a jump for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two edged sword, piercing the division of the soul and of the spirit of joints and of morrow and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. So what is the Word? Or should I more accurately ask, who is the Word? John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is the Word. The book is just what captures what Jesus is telling us. Um, The joint and the morrow, I've thought often about when he talks about the spirit, the soul and the spirit, divide, you know, discerning between the soul and the spirit and the bone and the morrow. I've always visualized that as if our spirit is laying within the body of our physical body, just like you have a bone and you have the morrow inside the bone. And I was always wondered, uh, and I don't know, that's just a thought that's in my mind, if this making a comparison so we have kind of an idea, you know, is, is, our, is our spirit in our our head or if it's in our foot or you know because you have if if that's the case and you have an amputee <laughs> you know so how, how that all relates I, I don't know exactly how that fits but uh, what it does show is that there that the the scrutiny of God's focus of Jesus's focus and his attention towards us is infinite in verse 13 it says no creature no creature is hidden from his sight but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account first time anybody first time you read that made you a little uncomfortable <laughs> to know that absolutely everything about my life is laid out absolutely just like a novel or an autobiography uh, in front of Jesus' eyes. Every thought, every, and he doesn't have to look it up. He just knows it. He just, he can remember it. Everything about our life, things that we don't even uh, realize. You know, there's things that come out of my mouth that I'm like fly by me and I have no clue what a, he even caught every one of those. And, <clears throat> That's a scary thought. <laughs> when I'm looking him in the eyes, we have to go through this uh, stuff. Uh, how long a meeting is that going to be? Uh, that's going to be pretty tough. Uh, there's examples that it gives us in Scripture. The woman at the well. I'm going to read this little story here. The woman said, I'm jumping in the middle of this, uh, uh, this little story, but the, the woman well said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here and draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You're right in saying you have no husband. You've had five husbands. And the one now is not your husband. What you have said is true. And the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. <laughs> Actually, much more than that. But uh, off the top of his head, boom, he knew exactly how many husbands she'd had, what her situation was, and, and with every one of us. As I've talked about before, 
about the scribes and the Pharisees. Um, it talks about he was without sin. Let him cast the first stone and the Pharisees stand there with their rocks ready to deal with somebody else's sin. And, and then he starts writing. And he starts writing. And he starts writing. And uh, pretty soon they all start dropping the rocks. Jesus knew every thing that they had done. Okay. For me, he knows everything that I have done. Mm -hmm. That can either be really comforting or really disconcerting. Mm -hmm. But you've seen the picture. You had, uh, all of you probably had little kids. And you've seen the pictures on YouTube or whatever about the little, the little kid, boy or girl, uh, in the kitchen. And they've got chocolate all around their mouth and, and crumbs on their shirt and, and chocolate on their front of their shirt. And, and, uh, and the parent asks them, did you eat those chocolate chip cookies? Nope. <laughs> I didn't eat them. And we laugh at that because we see that as kind of silly. And we laugh at it because it's cute and everything. Do we look any different <laughs> than that little child when we're dealing with God? He already sees it. So how does that make it harder to admit our sin? Or should that make it actually easier to admit our sin? <clears throat> the, uh, it's the, the only thing standing in uh, the way of that actually making it easier to admit our sin is one word. Pride. I'm so afraid that I'm, and it's even beyond that I'm afraid what you're going to think of me, because we already know that he already, it's, I'm afraid of what I have to admit about myself, and that's really hard to come to terms with. But that sets up this platform for the very next uh, verse, 414. Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. We can hold fast just because we know that Jesus has gone through everything with us. It says, for we have a high priest who is, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. He knows. He's been there. He's walked. He's become human. He's felt every urge. He's walked through every temptation. There's nothing that we go through that he can't say, yep, I remember dealing with that temptation. And yet, he never failed. He can't relate to our failure. He can't relate to our guilt, but he can relate to the temptation. But what a better person to be a high priest for us. He doesn't look down on us because he knows what it was like. He knew how hard it was to deal with the temptations that we go with. But to know we got somebody that knows every sin that I've ever committed. And yet loves me with a power that I can't grasp. Um, how confusing to our emotions is it to accept both of those we think the worse a person is the less they deserve to be loved <clears throat> um, I used to uh, have a potty mouth in fact that was a guy in the Navy who told me I had a potty mouth <laughs> at one time and I got to thinking you know that probably is counterproductive to my testimony <laughs> and I needed to, to stop that and uh, I don't know if any of you get you guys probably never had to deal with that kind of a challenge uh, <laughs> and uh, I got convicted more and more about dealing with this issue and uh, I had a friend of mine uh, tell me, he says, he went through the same thing. And uh, <clears throat> so he said he, his wife had recommended something to him. And so I decided to try it. He said, take you a quart jar. <laughs> Some of you already know where I'm going with this. He said, put it beside your bed. Don't put a lid on it because it'll just be in the way. Yeah. And uh, he says, every time one of those words come out of your mouth, Every time you have to stop whatever you're doing, wherever you're at, you have to turn around and leave and go put 
a dime or a penny. Do it something that's ridiculous. If you put ten dollars in there, there's a value to that trip. But uh, if it's a penny, it's an almost an insult to have to go to that much effort to put a penny in this jar, right? He said a dime is a good is a good dime. I said, oh well, that sounds easy enough. I, and I commit it. And he said, promise me you do it. Says a hundred percent of the time. And I'm like, all right. <laughs> it doesn't matter if you're at the movie theater with a girl. It does not matter if you're at the beach. It doesn't matter if you're in the middle of a grocery store. It doesn't matter if you're in school. It doesn't matter wherever you're at. You have to stop, drop whatever you're doing. Go out to the parking lot, get in the car, drive all the way across town, go to, you know, walk and park your car, walk into the house, unlock the door, go in, go into the bedroom. Oh, I don't have a dime. I gotta go, I gotta go get, 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 get my dime. <laughs> and go out, get the dime, come back in and put that dime in that jar. Whew. He said, you'll probably fill up that much of the jar fairly quickly. He said, but you'll be surprised. You won't, you'll, you'll never get halfway up that jar because pretty soon the consequences have its own effect. And they said, you'll only know how serious you are for how willing you are to maintain that habit. And believe me, you start watching, it is possible to watch, start, watch what comes out of your mouth whenever you tie that kind of inconvenience to it. <laughs> you start training yourself to stop. <laughs> Now, I won't be guilty of promoting any of Jim, Jim Carrey's movies. And I don't know if you guys have ever <laughs> watched a Jim Carrey movie. Uh, now he's got some. He is very silly, very talented at being silly. But there's one movie called Liar Liar, yes. and uh, anybody knows uh, this movie. He is an attorney. He's not a noble attorney. He's not even. He, I was going to say not a good one. I don't know that he wasn't a good attorney, but he was not. He had a problem with lying, really bad problem with lying. And he was divorced, and he had a son, and he was supposed to, he promised, he missed a lot of stuff with his son, and that's why he was divorced. Well, his son made him promise that he was going to be to his whatever birthday, little kid. And he didn't come to his birthday, missed it. And his birthday, or the son, when he was getting ready to blow the cake out make a wish, what do you think his wish was? His dad could not tell a lie. His dad's out, Jim Carrey's out doing whatever. All of a sudden, something happened. I don't remember all the analogies, and that's probably a good thing. But uh, all of a sudden, everything he thought come tumbling out of his mouth. He couldn't have a thought without it coming out of his mouth. <laughs> And I thought, wow, <laughs> am I really aware of everything that goes on behind that wall, that in, that that clear wall that keeps all the inside voice stuff behind and, and the outside voice keeps that separate? Am I really aware of what goes on behind the wall of all the stuff that goes through my head? And uh, I was thinking... If what had happened to Jim Carrey, we laugh at him because he was a creep and he played a creep and everything. But if everything I thought came out of my mouth, now you guys probably think I'm pretty much there already, but <laughs> but uh, can you imagine how it would affect your daily life and how it might clear up really where we are, how God sees, he sees all that clutter that goes through our head. And... Uh, that makes me feel pretty self-conscious. But that is that grace that we have before Christ. If I become a closer Paul, uh, I'm going to back up and do this. I'm going to, that would take me a long time to explain it that way. Paul, this would be a lot quicker. Paul, when he became an apostle, he talked about in 1 Corinthians 9, he was defending his apostleship. I want you guys to know I'm an apostle just like any of the other apostles. And he was defending his credibility. I'm, a, I'm an apostle. And he was right. He wasn't lying. He was, he was straight up. But you see in another place, in 1 Corinthians 9, 2, he says, um, no, I'm sorry, 15, 9, he starts to call himself the least of the apostles. Well, what brought that change in the way he saw himself? And then in First Titus, First Titus, in Titus 1.15, he says that he is the chief of sinners. Well, what brought that view of himself, if you would call it so low or maybe so accurate? Conviction. Conviction. 
another thing though, he had moved closer and closer and closer to God. And the closer you are to God, the more love you feel from God. But the shadows that are cast from yourself, from being in God's presence, uh, all of a sudden you start to see just how sinful and evil, how much evil and sin is in our life. And that leads you to a very confused mixed emotion. Because if we can't have a grasp, or the more that our grasp of our um, understanding of, and I'm trying to find it here, and I lost it, and you can tell. <laughs> oh, there it is. Without knowing how horrible our sin is, we can't grasp the full depth of God's love for us because His love outweighs all of the sin that we have uh, in our life. So that's why Paul, as the closer he got to God, the more he saw how evil he was, the, the dependency on the redemption of Christ, but yet the full acceptance. Uh, in Ephesians 3, 14 to 19, it says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, whom every family family in heaven and on earth is named according to the riches of his glory that he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend all the saints with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God our sin cannot keep us from God and our acceptance of that creates our dependency on God that I absolutely am so dependent on God. I don't have any chance to be worthy of God. Um, the, con the confidence that we have to go before God has nothing to do with how good we are, but who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. yes, and just as we go through Hebrews here, the, it just brings this, that picture of, of the, the Jews at the Jordan. Did they understand? They didn't understand what they were turning away from. And it is for us as well, when we're sharing the gospel with people, do we help them understand that the bad, they either don't see how bad they are, which only God and the Holy Spirit can do that. But those that do, that God's love is there. It's not, I can make you so good that you can work a heaven or, or your sins won't count or that sin's okay. But God loves you in spite of that sin. Jesus paid the price for you. We have that permission to be before God. We can go before the throne of heaven because of our dependency on, on Jesus. And for just people here, you know, if you have come to learn about Jesus that way, if that your dependence on him, that um, I'm not going to be able to go to heaven. How in the world am I going to get to heaven because I, I am guilty of sin? I just pray that you would think about that, that you would come. If you want to come up and, and, uh, and you know, play a song and uh, have a hymn of, divin of uh, yes, that. <laughs>